Okay. Er vi lege med? Ja. Så der. Så, hej og velkomne. Jeg håper det er noen der ute som, som, som lyssnar på oss. Vi vet ikke riktig sikkert, for det finns ingen overhovedet her i, i salen i dag. Så, så uh, jeg skal gi en kort introduktion. Mitt navn er Ola Pettersson, og det er jeg og Lasse som er ansvarlig for den her kursen. Uh, og så kommer Lasse å prate, og sedan så kommer jag at börja de vanliga föreläsningarna på kursen och, och avsluta dem under, under dagens gång här så att säga. Eh, och jag kommer att, eh, mina föreläsningar kommer att vara på engelska. Eh, eh, ja. Så. Eh, alla föreläsningar här kommer faktiskt hem, ha, ske idag, inte bara de första två dagarna, utan kommer, kommer ske idag. Och, eh, Kursen är egentligen eh, en, en, ett mjukvaruprojekt eh, där ni kommer att eh, se lite. Så ni kommer att delas in i, eh, i Scrum Teams. Så Scrum är metodologin som vi, vi kommer att använda för att, för att eh, managera det här projektet. Så varje student kommer, kommer att eh, placeras på ett Scrum Team och de här Scrum Teamen kommer att vara eh, cross-functional. Så vi, så Lasse har redan skickat ut en, en lista med frågor till er, vilka teknologier, vilka, hur starka ni är på olika teknologier. Och eh, syftet med det är helt enkelt att, att hitta en sån någorlunda balanserad indelning mellan de olika teamen här. Det, så, så svaren på de frågorna där är, är högst subjektiva och ni kommer inte att, vi kommer inte att, att ifrågasätta hur ni är, så att säga, utvärderar er själva, i er, er egen kapacitet. Utan bara för teamindelning. Eh, så varje team kommer att jobba med ett projekt. Jag tror att de kommer att jobba med samma projekt, alla, alla teamen. Vi kommer att ha veckoliga eh, iterationer. Eh, och vi kommer att eh, visa, ni kommer att visa vad ni har gjort efter, efter varje, i slutet av varje, varje iteration. Och de mötena är obligatoriska. Ni måste vara närvara på de här mötena. Om ni inte kan närvara på de här mötena så, så, så måste ni meddela i förhand. Eh, och och så att säga, god, godtagliga orsaker är okej, okay, men, men eh, cat I ate my homework duger inte. Då får ni komma på något bättre om det faktiskt var det som skedde. Eh, ska vi se. Och sen så finns det då dagliga möten som också är obligatoriska. Hur de sker, givet att de flesta studenter här är, är på olika orter i landet, så kommer de här dagliga mötena att ske. Eh, över något slags, något slags eh, eh, Skype eller, eller, eller eh, Slack eller vad ni nu använder för någonting för att kommunicera. Eh, men det får ni hitta. Vi kommer att prata mer om det senare. Lasse kommer att prata mer om det senare. Och sen så är det en slutlig presentation. Den är inte 10 januari utan den är, jag kommer att rätta till de här när jag laddar upp dem till, till Course Press. Jag tror den är den 17 eller 18 januari. Torsdag, torsdag den sista veckan under, under den här läsperioden. Så allting kommer att publiceras i CoursePress, eh, kommunikationsverktyg, kommer att vara Slack va? eh, eh, för att, för att alltså Project Management Tool kommer att vara Redmine som är en gammal, gammal applikation. Eh, det finns mycket häftigare, mer, mer, mer eh, så att säga, modifierbara eh, verktyg idag, men Redmine är en gammal, trygg ett gammalt tryggt verktyg som, som är nästan skräddarsytt för Scrum just. Så du har inte massa bells and whistles som ni inte behöver. Och ni kommer att använda eh, GitHub för, för er, er så att säga, source code management. Eh, examination. Eh, det kommer att vara veckolig, veckoliga eh, anonyma peer reviews. Eh, vilket innebär att, att varje student, efter varje iteration så kommer varje student att få 40 virtuella dollar. Eh, 
Och 20 av de här dalarna handlar om, om, om tekniskt eh, bidrag och 20 av dalarna handlar om, om så att säga, bidrag till eh, eller följa, bidrag och följande av Scrum-processen som sådan. Kursen handlar om processen, va? Kursen handlar inte om teknologier utan du kan tänka dig att processen är en teknologi som sådan, men inte informationsteknologier så att säga. Va? Eh, så du kommer att, du kommer att, varje student kommer att få de här 40 dalarna, 20 i, i två olika dimensioner. Och, och, och eh, du kan ge de här 20 dalarna till vem du vill på ditt team. Så att säga. Du kan, du kan, om, du, om ni är sex personer, sju personer i teamet, och, eh, då har du 20 dalar att dela ut till sex olika personer. Du får inte ge några dalar till dig själv. Och du kan ge alla 20 dalarna till en person om du vill. Eller kan du sprida dem jämnt. Du gör precis hur du vill. Utan det handlar om din subjektiva uppfattning om hur den personen bidrog under den sista iterationen din subjektiva uppfattning. Eh, och den kan vara olika med olika människor givetvis. Eh, och så examinationen som sådan är sedan en kombination av, av hur många så att säga, dollar du får av dina, dina peers på ditt team kombinerat med då en, 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 ett, ett betyg för, för, för teamet som sådan så att säga. Som sätter en slags no, 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 normal läge, normal nivå på, på teamet. Så här är ett exempel. Så här har vi då ett team med sju personer och en person då har då givit i, 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 efter en iteration till exempel då här sju dollar till Peter för hans tekniska bidrag under den sista iterationen. Men han fick bara två scrum dollar och det betyder då att, att den här personen som ger de här dollarna, du, anser att Peter bidrog väldigt mycket tekniskt så att säga, i den här sista iterationen, men inte speciellt mycket med Scrum. Eh, om vi tittar på eh, Beton här, så visar det sig att Beton bidrog inte alls tekniskt, enligt din uppfattning. Eh, men hon eller han, jag vet inte om det är ett kvinnligt eller ett manligt namn, eh, eh, jo, bidrog lite åtminstone när det kommer till Scrum. Så lite regler runt det här. Eh, de här peer reviews, och anledningen till att vi har peer reviews är så att vi kan undvika en, 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 en tentamen på slutet, för det här är ändå ett projekt. Va? Eh, och i och med att det är ett projekt så, så handlar det mycket om att göra här snarare än, handlar mer om att göra än så att säga, resultatet som helhet. Va? Eh, så, så, och vi som, som lärarpersonal, vi har ju ingen aning egentligen om vad som sker internt i teamet under veckorna. Vi ser, Lasse kommer att träffa er en gång per vecka då när ni visar vad ni har gjort sista veckan. Men vem som gjorde vad, det kan vi inte hålla reda på. Utan det håller ni reda på själva, så att säga, åt oss genom era peer reviews. Så, peer reviews måste fylla, fylla sig antingen samma dag som iterationen avslutas eller dagen efter. Eh, och om du inte fyller i den så kommer du att få noll dollar, så att säga. Även om du har fått dollar av dina peers så kommer vi att sätta din, di, dina mottagna dollar till noll. För du har ju inte givit något till någon så då kan du inte få någonting heller. Eh, och om du inte skickar in det här eller om du får dåliga reviews, alltså riktigt dåliga, få dollar av dina peers eh, en gång, eller två, två gånger, så, så kommer du få en varning. Och... Betrakta den varningen som att du, du fallerar den första tentan. Det är vad det betyder. Eh, och när du får din andra varning så har du fallerat den andra tentan. Och då, och då, 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 då har du fallerat kursen och du kickas ut ur teamet. Du får inte fortsätta längre. Och, och en annan anledning till att vi gör det här är att, att, att eh, vi försöker då hitta de här som inte bidrar va? Så, så snabbt som möjligt. Så att, för det är ganska demoraliserande för de som är kvar och jobbar hårt att det finns sådana här freeloaders i, inom teamet. Va? Så vi kickar ut de här så snabbt vi bara kan så att de som är kvar faktiskt utför arbete. Eh, och gaming och peer reviews kommer också resultera i en, en, i en varning. Och hur kan, man, hur kan man göra gaming och peer reviews? Ja, och man kan till exempel inte vara sanningsenlig i, sin subjektiva, i uttrycket av sin subjektiva uppfattning om sina peers. Jag kan ju fråga er, hur vet vi det? Ja, det, 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 det ser vi när vi börjar titta på datan. Så ser vi om ni är sanningsenliga eller inte. Va? Eh, till exempel så ser vi ofta att de som, som, som inte bidrar egentligen, de tenderar att ge varandra dollar. 
Medan de som bidrar ger inga dollar till de som inte bidrar. Så vi ser en klar stratifiering av två studentgrupper inom teamet. Om, det, om, om, det, om så är fallet så att säga. Det var allt jag hade och nu ska Lasse prata lite om, om projektet och lite logistiska grejer. Och sen så kommer jag fortsätta då med, med den vanliga föreläsningen. Vi ser här. Perfekt. Då så, då är det jag som pratar och jag heter Lars Karlsson. Och det är, det är mig som ni kommer att prata med när det gäller då att hantera det här projektet i sin helhet. Om du har några frågor om scheman och vad som ska innehålla den här kursen så är det mig ni pratar med. I övrigt så är det alltså Ola som ni pratar med. Eh, och som ni ser på, på adressen där, e-mailadressen, så, så eh, är det här ingen eh, eh, äkta linje universitetsadress utan jag är inhyrd från näringslivet då, så att jag kommer ta med mig det in i den här, i den här kursen också. Och när, vi, när jag pratar mer så, så kommer jag prata via den här kurssidan som finns då, eh, som är en kurspress-sida. Och eh, meddelar jag någonting så meddelar jag det där, men så vet jag också att det finns en slackgrupp för det här och förra året och året innan så var ni studenter väldigt aktiva där och pratade sinsemellan. Jag tittar inte speciellt mycket på den överhuvudtaget. Då. Sen har vi då den här kanalen och den kanalen som vi är på nu här idag då, den ni ser där. Och vill ni se på alla så ser ni att det finns då en, en modersida där som är eh, forward slash live helt enkelt. Eh, sen kommer vi då till det som Ola pratade om det här med, med projektet och teamen och det och eh, de här teamen ska ju basera sig på att ni, ni har jämna grupper och då vet ni att jag har skickat ut en sån cross function question formulär till er via mail och så stod det i det här mejlet att jag vill ha svar på det senast klockan klockan 12 den här fredagen och klockan 15 så lovar jag att jag kommer skicka ut teamen Eh, och det gör jag alltså via CoursePress-sidan då. Eh, de här teamen då, som Ola sagt, är Scrum. Och det betyder då att det kommer finnas två stycken falanger i det här. Det ena är ju då ut själva utvecklings utvecklingsteamet och det andra är ju då eh, den som kommer att vara Scrum Master. Och det här kommer vi diskutera då eh, nästa vecka. Och eh, när vi då är inne på det här med projektet så Tänker jag mig följande, att vi ska prata om en parkerings, ett parkeringssystem. Eh, och tittar man på ett parkeringssystem, när man tänker med det här första gången så, ja ah, men det här, det här låter ju ganska lätt det här egentligen. Eh, och hur mycket kan man göra med en, en parkeringsplats egentligen? Ja, men börjar man fundera på det här så kan man, man kan börja dela in det här i roller. Och jag, jag har hittat några roller här, ni kommer säkert hitta flera i det här. Men en är ju den som till exempel då hyr ut sina parkeringsplatser. Eh, och den här, den här personen eller det här företaget, för att jag ser ju att jag, Lars Karlsson, skulle kunna faktiskt ha en parkeringsplats på min uppfart till exempel. Den hyr jag ut och det kostar en krona i timmen att vara på den då. Eh, men jag kan ha flera stycken parkeringsplatser. Jag kan ha... En på min uppfart, jag kan, ha, jag kan ha gården bredvid, jag kan ha lite överallt ute på vägen då, som jag äger till exempel. Men jag kan också vara ett företag som tillhandlar stora, stora parkeringsområden då, helt enkelt. Eh, men som, som parkerare, som konsument i det här så kan jag också vara en privatperson som är ute och, och parkerar. Jag kan också vara ett företag och då har jag företagskonton helt plötsligt i de här... Eh, vid de här parkeringstillfällena. Då. Och man kan parkera per minut eller per timme. Jag kan parkera hyra en plats per månad eller per år. Eh, är jag företag så vill jag ha samlat konto för det här. 
Eh, har jag en GPS i min telefon, vilket de flesta har, så vill jag ju till exempel få reda på eh, om jag har lämnat min parkeringsplats innan parkeringstiden har gått ut. Och det kan man ju fundera på hur det går till, men jag misstänker att, att um, om jag uh, har lämnat området och kör i mer än 40 km h timmen så sitter jag nog i bilen och då kan man ställa en fråga. Uh, vill du då avsluta den här parkeringen? Ja eller nej? Uh, och det är det jag menar den sista punkten, den här location awareness. Uh, sen kommer vi då till den här, den här funderingen. Vart vill jag att det här systemet ska fungera i så fall? Uh, ja, jag vill ju att det ska fungera som en webbapplikation. Men varför kan vi inte ha det på en Android eller en iPhone också i så fall? Eh, men det här är någonting som vi får diskutera lite, lite framöver. Um, det är ju trots allt meningen så att det, det vi ska öva på är Scrum. Eh, och de här agila delarna i det här, inte, inte rent tekniskt då. Eh, det här är då en liten, liten kort introduktion till vad jag vill att vi ska göra för någonting. Den exakta delen i det här, det är någonting som vi kommer att prata om nästa vecka. När jag vet vilka team vi har så kommer jag också meddela en tidpunkt när vi ska träffas och, och diskutera då vad det här systemet ska göra och vad ska vi göra under den första iterationen och så. Så att det här är bara en väldigt kort beskrivning av vad jag vill ha gjort i det här systemet. Tittar man då på en Scrum Master, och det här kommer ni få reda på om en liten stund vad det där är för någonting. Så den, det kommer funka på det här sättet att vi kommer ha två stycken Scrum Masters. Och de här två Scrum Masters de kommer få var sin del i det här projektet. Så att vi delar in den här, den här kursen i, i två hälfter så att ena Scrum Mastern är för den första halva och sen byter vi till den andra Scrum Mastern till den andra delen. Och det betyder ju då att som Scrum Master kan ni behöva lite hjälp ibland och då kan ni få lite mentorstid och den mentorstiden den bokar ni med mig. Så det är bara Scrum Mastern som sitter ner med mig via Skype. Och så pratar vi om de problemen som du har som Scrum Master. Ehm, till skillnad kanske från, från verk i, i, i en, ett äkta projekt eller vad man ska säga, i verksamhet i näringslivet eller någon annanstans. Så till skillnad från det så deltar ni som Scrum Master även i utvecklingsteamet. Så att det, det kanske inte en del som är, är Scrum Fanatiker här eh, skriker säkert rakt ut, men det är till för att ni ska få en känsla för den agila processerna i de här sakerna. Sen då kommer vi till en annan sak och det är produktägarmötet. När vi ska då sitta ner för att, att titta på vad ni har lyckats göra under en iteration. Då pratar ni med mig i egenskap av produktägare, för jag, jag har ganska många roller i det här. Ehm, och då träffas vi en gång i veckan och den tidpunkten den bestämmer vi när vi känner för det hela. Jag brukar föreslå fredag och det brukar accepteras. Och vi träffas via Skype och då visar ni på Skype vad ni har gjort och så funderar vi på om det där var bra eller dåligt då. Och det är någonting som jag, jag berättar. Och eh, vid det mötet så bestämmer vi också vad ni ska göra till nästa iteration. Så att det är ett möte för den som är Scrum Master, om de vill. Och så har vi det produktägarmötet som vi alltid har varje vecka. Och det brukar ta ungefär en timme, det kan ta en och en halv timme. Det beror lite på hur, hur snabbt det här går. Det går, kan gå på en halvtimme också. Mm. Och kom ihåg det här att Nästa vecka, för jag vet ju inte de exakta datumen och de exakta teamen än, så jag kommer att skriva på kurssidan vilka tider jag vill att vi träffas då. Och då kommer vi träffas en och en halv timme ungefär per team. Den där hoppar vi över och så kommer vi till den här slutliga presentationen och den har jag för mig är den 17. Du kan 
10 till 15. Jag är inte hundra säker på det heller, men det är en bit tills dess då. Med de här orden nu så, så hoppas jag att ni har fått en, en känsla för vad vi ska göra i den här kursen. Det, det kanske låter och känns lite luddigt, men det är det, det, är det inte. Och är det så att ni gör det i alla fall så det är det helt okej. Okay. Vi ska lära oss det här efterhand. Det är bättre att ni vet det efteråt. Mm. Och eftersom det inte finns så många personer här inne. Det är typ jag och Ola. Så är det väldigt svårt att ställa frågor. Så att jag tänker mig så här att har ni några frågor. Skriv ett mejl till mig. Så ska vi försöka reda ut detta. Okej. Okay. Tackar. And we we would thank Lasse and uh, there's all me. So uh, get used to this. Let's see here. There we go. So, uh, I will speak English. All the slides are in English. Uh, I have never presented this kind of stuff in Swedish. So it's better for everybody because I know you all, you all know English. Uh, so the first, so essentially I'm going to deliver three, three lectures today. Uh, the first one is on, on a kind of introduction to project management. And I don't really, I don't know you guys. I don't know what your background is. Uh, but I kind of feel that this is necessary. Uh, so this, we're going to go through kind of the, uh, the waterfall process of how that, how that works. And, uh, and then contrast that one to, uh, to, to agile methodologies. And then we're going to... Uh, uh, only talk about one particular Agile methodology after that, and that is Scrum. Um, but so this, this first part here is, uh, is a little bit dry and, uh, and, 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 and yeah, kind of borderline boring, I would say. Um, but so, so here's the agenda for this, for this uh, uh, um, what we do before, before lunch today. Um, so first I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I, who I am uh, and it's kind of mostly so that because I have a, I have a pretty unusual background for a, for a university professor and, uh, and I've actually done some of these things that I'm talking about, which is uh, helpful. Uh, and then we'll talk about what a project is, what project management is. We're going to talk about the project life cycle and that's going to be kind of Dry. Uh, I'm going to do some, uh, some fake case study to exemplify the project life cycle. Uh, we're going to talk about why project management is, is, uh, is hard. Uh, and then we're going to start to talk a little bit about modern methodologies. And then after lunch, we'll dive into to, to Scrum, which is one of those methodologies. So, so who am I? So I, 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 I did my uh, PhD in, uh, in data structures and algorithms. So I'm a theoretician. I didn't write a single line of code during my PhD studies, but uh, it's only uh, algorithm, or theor uh, uh, theorems and proofs and algorithms. Uh, then I, I met my now wife, and uh, uh, she, she lived in Berlin at the time, and I, I lived in Sweden. Uh, but she's, she's Chinese. Uh, uh, spent many years in New York, and uh, after a couple of years, she uh, she she decided she wanted to go back to New York, and uh, and and I said, "What about me?" I said, "Yeah, what about you? Uh, you would find have to find a way to get your ass over to New York City." 
uh, if you want this to continue. So I did. Uh, so I, I, I got some research funding and, and moved over to, to New York City with her and, uh, and uh, did research at Columbia University in uh, Manhattan for a couple of years. Then I ran out of money, uh, out of funding, that is. So I need to find a job. And uh, I decided that, uh, that I wanted to, to try the private sector. Uh, academia felt a little bit, kind of a little bit dusty somehow. Uh, so I left academia and uh, entered the, uh, the uh, cutthroat uh, world of, of uh, uh, kind of tec technical industry, IT industry in New York City. Uh, spent 14 years there. Uh, so I, I, I wrote things up and I, I wrote it down. Uh, I was wealthy on paper one day and, and dirt poor on paper the next day. Uh, it was, I happened to be at the, the, the right time, right place at the right time. And it was a lovely time uh, to be part of that, part of the intensity, the craziness. There was, like, there was no, no limits at all. Nobody saw any limits as to what could be done. So it was uh, kind of like the, the, the golden days in the, in the Wild West, even though this was the, the Wild East. Uh, I started a couple of companies. I worked for a number of startups. Started a couple of companies, uh, uh, none of which exist today, just the way it is. That's okay. Perfectly okay. Failure is good, as long as you can deal with it. Um, and uh, I was the chief technology officer at a number of startups. Uh, then eventually I ended up at a company called DoubleClick, uh, which was the, uh, at the time the, uh, uh, the biggest uh, uh, advertising technology uh, 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 provider. And uh, I was there for many years, and, and uh, then we heard a rumor that, that somebody was trying to, bu to buy us. And there was this bidding war between Google and uh, Microsoft and uh, AOL, I think. And, uh, and uh, it started at $2.1 billion. And uh, eventually we were sold for $3.1 billion to, to, to Google in uh, 2008, I think it was, that the deal went through. And it was Google's biggest acquisition at that point in time, uh, kind of twice as big as, as uh, when I bought YouTube uh, a few years before that. Uh, it turned out to be a very, very good acquisition for them. Really what they bought was, was the, uh, the, the know-how and the client relationships rather than the technology itself. We, we had seen that they uh, uh, had already started to build something like what DoubleClick had, but, but they, they failed at doing it. And, and they didn't fail because we were technically superior to them. You know, on the contrary, they were technically superior to us at DoubleClick. But, uh, but uh, uh, the business relationships was something that they didn't really fully understand at the time. Uh, they had mostly long tail, so small mom and pop shops as, as, as customers for their uh, paid search and, uh, and AdSense products. Uh, but they didn't really know how to deal with the big advertisers, the, 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 the uh, Coca-Colas and Procter and & Gamble's of the world. Uh, and we did, so they bought us. So at DoubleClick and then at Google as well, I was responsible for a lot of people. I had 150 uh, uh, developers, architects, designers, and testers, five locations, uh, three in the US, one in Germany, and one in India. And, uh, and I actually implemented, uh, or was a big part of, I would say, implementing uh, an agile project management methodology across the entire organization of, of, of 300 and more than 300 engineers here. So, so I've done this, right? Uh, so I felt the pain. And I know it's not easy. It's, uh, it's really simple, but extremely hard to do. Right? The ideas are simple. The ideas are, are, are commonsensical. Uh, nobody feels that they are, they are no, almost nobody is at odds with the ideas of Agile, uh, but it might still be hard to actually implement it and, and make, make the whole thing hum. Uh, then in 2009, I, uh, I left Google 
and, and went to Linnaeus University. And uh, so I moved from Brooklyn to, uh, <laughs> to Vecchio, uh, which might strike people as kind of odd, but you know, we are in different phases in our lives. Uh, I, we had been there for 16 years at that point, and, uh, and, and we were tired, tired of, uh, of the big city life. We also had a four-year-old daughter at the time, and, uh, and uh, we really wanted for her to, to learn how to, to ski, and skate, and uh, engage with, uh, with the elements around us, with nature, uh, instead of uh, uh, learning how to use a subway pass, you know? It's, uh, it's there, there, are, there are nice things with having a kid in a big city. Uh, and sometimes my friends say, well, yeah, you know, the quality of the, of the theaters, the plays that they're showing for kids is unbelievable. The thing is, the thing is that, you know, the kids don't care. <laughs> so, so if that quality is super high, it doesn't really matter that much for the kids. Uh, so for us, it was kind of more important to, to, to have a, to, to take, to take, to, to, to gear down. You know, to take it down a couple of notches and, 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 and land on Earth again. Uh, I, I, still, I still remember one day in New York, I, I, I was thinking, you know, did I, did I touch or walk on anything today that, was, that is not man-made? And the answer was a resounding no. Not even close. So, and, and that didn't feel good somehow. You know, we live in these a box suspended in the sky in some apartment building and then you know you take the elevator down and walk into the subway and you get into to the city and you walk from the subway to your office and it doesn't matter what the weather is it's not affecting you so you're kind of sheltering yourself from from the very basis of your own existence and uh, and uh, that just didn't feel good for me so I, I wanted to, to uh, get closer to Mother Earth because that's where I come from and that's where I'm going back to <laughs> One day, so 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 I I I, I went came back to Sweden to Linnaeus University, uh, and uh, I've been giving these kind of courses there. Uh, and then after after a few years there, I started to started to itch. It was too too dusty. Nothing was happening, so I became an entrepreneur again. Uh, started a company, which failed again, uh, which is also okay. Uh, no, there's no bitterness whatsoever. It's rather just gratitude for, for having been able to, to do it, to try it. Uh, and so I went back to academia, to Linnaeus University. And uh, as, of, as of Friday next week, I will be uh, located in, uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, uh, just three, 30 kilometers uh, south of, uh, of San Francisco. And uh, I'll be back here every now and then. I'm still uh, partially employed by the university. Uh, so I'll be back here for uh, giving uh, s seminars and some lectures when courses are starting. And then I'm coming back for examination. And I will pull some strings from, from over there. But uh, there are people here who do the kind of the daily or weekly interaction with students and I'm kind of in the in, in, in the background so that's me so so the point of this is really to 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 convince you to to listen to me because I've, I've done what I'm talking about so here we go uh, the uh, uh, the boring stuff is starting so, so what is a project? The project is a temporary endeavor to accomplish a unique product, service, or result. Right? So a project has some goals, whatever it was we want to accomplish with this. It has a time frame, so it has an end date. Otherwise, it's business as usual, and then it's, that's not a project. A, pro a time frame, an end, an end date for a project is necessary in order for it to be a project, really. It has resources associated with it, and typically people. Uh, it has uh, somebody needs to own it, right? Who's responsible for this? 
for the outcome of the project. There's a budget associated with it, which is both people and, uh, and, uh, and uh, other resources that you, you, you might need. It could be uh, professional services, it could be uh, uh, IT-based services or whatever it is that might cost money. Uh, and it has an executive sponsor. Somebody up there in the organization, uh, not further up, uh, needs to, 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 to be sponsoring this, needs to say that, yes, we're doing this. Because if you don't have that person up there, uh, the project will never see the end of, it will never be run to completion, essentially. Because there's going to be some other ideas flying around, pitched to the executives, and they feel like one of those ideas is great, so let's do this in our organization. And then they're looking at what resources do we have. And they see this group of people here who are working on something, but there's nobody at the executive level who cares about whether that's being done or not. And so those resources will be pulled to something that an executive cares about. So executive sponsorship is, is critical, often forgotten. So if that is a project, now what is project management? Well, it's just management of making sure this happens. Right? So it's the discipline of achieving the project goals while adhering to the constraints. So in part of project management is the establishment of clear and achievable goals. Planning, organizing, securing, and managing the resources associated with the project. Balancing demands. Communicating about the project. Because if, if somebody up there in the organization sees that we're spending money on this project, they're going to want to know how it's going. Right? They're not going to be satisfied with, with only being presented with the outcome of the project once the project is finished. If, if it's just a black hole to the executive during the actual execution of the project, again, chances are they're not going to be satisfied and they might move the resources to something else. So communication is very, very important. And the biggest challenges to project management, well, it's human beings, I would say. Because we are irrational, unpredictable, we get sick, we don't get along with people, we have babies, we get injured, and, and it's just, there's no way you can control that. It's just the nature of the beast. So, so do not think of human beings as just kind of a cog in this machine, because that cog is going to grind to a halt every now and then. And, and uh, of course, it's going to happen when you least need it. Uh, other big challenge is uh, changing or incomplete requirements. And, and, and this is... Uh, this is also uh, the, the nature of the beast. Uh, it's Im essentially impossible to have, to have complete requirements that will not change. Uh, uh, to have complete requirements at the beginning of a project and for those requirements not to change during the duration of the project is essentially unheard of. So, so uh, y we need to somehow be open, embrace, and we'll get into that later when we get to Agile, embrace the fact that things will change. Whether we want it or not, they will change. And typically we don't want it. But, you know, the powers don't care what we want. We just have to, to adjust. So, this is a kind of a typical uh, uh, top level kind of a, a org chart for a, uh, for a company that's doing something related to IT. They have some sales, a sales organization, they have a marketing organization, they have a finance organization, they have product management, and then they have some form of engineering or, 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 or IT organization. And uh, typically project management is inside of engineering. It could also be somewhere else in the organization. So, who initiates projects? Well, you know, it's product management. It's, it's their job 
to, they're typically responsible for, for, for the, the return on investment or, or, or P&L, profit and loss of a particular product. <laughs> and, and so they are responsible, the product managers are responsible for, for understanding the marketplace. Right? So, so if this organization is in the business of making money, which corporations are by definition, then product management's responsibility is to try to figure out how can we make more money. Right? And that requires understanding the customers. And so the product management is essentially a proxy for, 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 for customers, uh, a proxy from the, from the inside of, the, of this organization's perspective. Uh, so, so new projects typically come from, from project management because it, it is their job to know what the customers need. But it could also come, uh, it could also come internally. Uh, it could be that the finance organization wants to, uh, they see uh, waste, some form of waste in the, in, in the organization and by cutting that waste you might cut some costs. So, so finance might initiate a project, an internal project that says, you know, let's do, let's try to, to figure out how to uh, optimize this, uh, this particular workflow, whatever it is, in order to, to uh, uh, reduce manual labor or, or whatever it is. Uh, or it could come from inside of the engineering organization because the engineering organization, you know, there's a lot of people there. They're not only techies normally and uh, I mean, they might have kind of technical idea, ideas for technical projects that would maybe cut costs or increase revenues or whatever it is. Uh, but they might also have ideas for business things because most, most uh, uh, IT folks, they also have some understanding of the business side. And we'll get to that later, how, how, uh, how critical that really is in order for things to work well. So, this will, I will bore you with this one now for a while. Uh, so this is kind of the traditional project life cycle. Uh, so we're not talking, we're not talking about kind of a waterfall approach to doing things, which is how the software industry has done things for, for since the very beginning until it started to change in the mid 90s and, 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 and now that change is, is, uh, is like a tidal wave, right? It's so, so even though this, d these can, this kind of process is, 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 is not used, especially, especially in new companies, this process is not used, uh, in new technology companies at least. Uh, but uh, it's still important to, <coughs> to see how things were done before. And, and it's this way of doing things that actually led to the introduction of, of agile methodologies, uh, which we'll talk about later. And it's simply because this didn't work, right? We, we try this as a, as, a, as a group of professionals. We try this for, for some, some 30 years or 20 years, 20, 25 years or something. And, and, and so we, we, we kind of uh, stubbornly stuck to this process, this way of doing things, which we had borrowed from the manufacturing industry. Uh, and we kept doing it this way, and we failed, and we failed, and we failed, uh, but we had no other way of doing it, so we kept failing until they started to really to think about this. What is it we're doing here? You know, is there a better way of doing this? Right? Because contrary to, to, to manufacturing industry, where you have a, you know, where you're building, building hardware, or, you, or if you build a house, or whatever it is, uh, oftentimes it's difficult to change things uh, when you build those kind of things uh, uh, after you've started because it's hardware. You know, it's hard to move the, the, the location of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the bathroom in the house that you're building uh, after you've, you know, built most of the house. But in software, that's doable, right? It's doable, so why do we kind of lock ourselves into a process where that's not doable. So instead, we're kind of turning things around and saying that, well, you know, if these things are doable, let's create a process based on, on, on what's doable. Let's create a process that can take into account empirical data after 
after the, the project has actually started. So traditional way, the waterfall way of doing th things is that you first have some form of, this applies to, 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 to any project really, you have some form of initiation phase and we'll go through these in, in excruciating detail and I will exemplify them as well. Uh, there's some form of initiation phase uh, followed by a planning phase, followed by an execution and control, that's where you actually do it, and then there's some form of completion phase at the end. So I'll go through each of these phases, kind of in theory first, what they mean, and then I will go through them again using examples. Uh, so, initiation phase. The question why is being asked. Why are we doing this? So somebody comes up with an idea of a project and you need to ask, this person needs to ask themselves the question, why do I want this done? What is the business value? And we're talking now about kind of for-profit businesses here. Right? What is the business value of this? Because if you cannot articulate a business value, how are you going to convince anybody that you're going to invest resources to do this if those resources instead could have, been could have been allocated to some other form of activity that improves the bottom line of the company, either increases revenues or cuts costs of the company. So, so the business value is critical. Uh, confirm sponsorship and funding. Who's, who's, who's going to be, be, uh, be uh, sponsoring this at the executive level and how is this going to be funded? Where we, yeah. uh, document and confirm scope and assumptions. Uh, so what is it that we're doing? What are we assuming? Uh, engage stakeholders. Stakeholders is, is kind of a, an umbrella term for everybody who has an interest in this project. Executives, end users, customers, suppliers, essentially a lot of people in the organization as well as outside the organization are going to be stakeholders. And you draft some form of a high level plan how this is going to happen. And you figure out who needs to provide services uh, for this project in order for us to be able to pull it off. Right? It might be that you need professional services from a consulting company. Right? It might be that you need a, 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 a cloud computing resources or whatever it is. Okay, so we're done with initiation. Then we go one to, to one more level of detail uh, in the planning phase. So uh, uh, dig down into the scope and requirements try to ask yourself, how is this going to be accomplished? Right? What, how, how are we going to do this? Uh, who's going to work on this? Uh, when is it going to start? When is it going to end? Uh, what's the budget for it? Uh, are there any risks involved here? I mean, it could be people risks. Uh, it could be kind of resource risks. It could be risks uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the competitive landscape. It could be that the competitor comes out with a product with a, with a, with a, with a product that is, is similar to what we're having. We know, might know that they're working on something. Some one risk might be, so how do we deal with them getting to the markets before us? That could be a risk. Uh, or it could be technical risks. And some form of communication plan. So once this project is started, how do we communicate the status of this project to the rest of the world or to those, to those who, who, who are interested in it? Okay, so now we have planned and now we simply do it. So we execute, right? Execute, we communicate, we monitor our progress, we monitor the risks that we have. There might be new risks com uh, co coming in throughout the project, project. We're tracking any changes that are happening and we keep the plan that we have up to date. And eventually we're finished and we conduct some form of review with the stakeholders, showing the stakeholders what is that has been uh, uh, produced. Uh, we develop some form of a handover plan because typically the people who are working on the project, uh, the vast majority of them when the project is finished are going to move on to, to, the next pro to a new project. They're not going to stay with the system that they built and maintain and enhance that. That's typically done by more uh, uh, kind of junior developers in order to get to learn about the system and so on. Right? So you don't put your heavy hitters, the most productive people, on maintenance tasks. That's just never happening. That's just bad business behavior. 
<laughs> and uh, and then you, uh, you, you hold some form of retrospective at the end about the project. So, so how did this go? What can we, what can we learn from what we did? Uh, did we make any mistakes that we want to try to avoid next time? Uh, was there anything that kind of worked well that we would like to, 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 to keep in mind for the next project that we're doing? So. Then really, inside of the execution and control, uh, you can think of having the, because I've ta been talking about this essentially uh, not in the context of, of, of IT, but if execution and control means building a system or building something technical, yeah, I mean that in itself typically then results in, in another waterfall process where you're planning technical things, you are analyzing technical things, you're designing, you're implementing, and you're testing, and you're, and, 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 uh, and you're delivering this. So there's really another waterfall within, within the execution and control here. Uh, doesn't make it any better. There's two of them. So, so here's a little, little example. Uh, so I've call this uh, a basket of search results. And, and so one day when, when uh, the one of the, the, the Google founders, Sergey Brin, was, uh, was sitting in front of his uh, device, uh, he realized that, that, you know, all these, if I do a search and I find something that, that I don't want to consume now, but I want to save it for later. I might be kind of in the, in the hunting mode. I'm not in the harvesting mode. I'm in the hunting mode. I want to look for things that I might want to use in the future, right? So think of it as, I mean, search, the way search is today, which search, by the way, has not changed in 25 years. It's still, you go to a search engine, there's a text field. You present it with a text feel, field. You're supposed to enter a string there, and then you click a button. And then you get back a list of, of references, links, to that the search engine deems are the most likely to contain the answer to the question that you expressed through a string in the text field. Uh, and that was the same 25 years ago. You enter a search string, you click a button, you get back a number of links. Same thing as 25 years ago. I mean, you might ask the question, okay, how about as answering my question instead of providing with me, with me with a number of links? If you know what the answer to the question is, and oftentimes you're asking pretty it's pretty obvious what the answer to the question is. Most of, most of the searches uh, tend to be about entities, some form of entities that have attributes. It could be national parks, or it could be football games, or, or what have you. So oftentimes, the search engine has a very good idea what you're looking for, uh, but it tends not to give you the answer. It gives you a link to the answer. And there's only one reason for that. Because if they give you the answer, they're not making any money, right? And they are in the business of making money. So it's not in their interest to give you the answer unless they make some money in the process, unfortunately. Uh, but, but so back to the search scenario, right? You, you're entering a search string and you get some results back. And then the, the, the the, the use case, this use, the scenario that this, is, this, this, this system behavior is built for is what I call hit and run search. And so the assumption is that the user has, has some question. That's why they engage in a session with a search engine. And they sit there and they might, the user might, might refine the queries, they might know the, the different kind of fancy tools that you can use to, to prune the result set to fast to get to what you're looking for. Uh, but the assumption is that eventually you either find what you're looking for and so you disengage from this session 
with the search engine, or you don't find we, what you're looking for, and you still disengage from this. So it's hit and run, right? You go there, look for the answer, either you find it or you don't, either way, you walk away. But what if, what if the reason you're engaging with the search engine is, is that it's some form of knowledge acquisition pursuit? Say that, say that I, I would like, I've decided I want to build, uh, in the spring, I want to start to build a wooden sailboat by myself, right? So I engage with a, with a search engine and I find some links to interesting material about how to build a, a wooden sailboat. Now, where do I save those links? I, I don't, I don't want to consume them now. At this point, I'm, collect, I'm gathering information. It's a knowledge acquisition effort I'm part of right now. And later on, I might consume that or might not. But, but for now, I'm gonna, I want to put it aside, kind of save it for a little bit. Uh, and what do you do? What do you do today? I mean, you find these links and you open them up in separate tabs or something, and then you have 20 tabs there? Or do you save them as bookmarks or something? Because the, the management tools for provided to us by the browser for, uh, for either for tabs or for, for bookmarks are, 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 are uh, barely usable. Right? So what do you do? I mean, some people are now starting to use personal knowledge managers, like, uh, uh, I mean, I'm using Evernote now for, for, for these kind of things. But it's, it's not integrated in the search engine itself, where, 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 where its natural place would be. Why should I have a separate system outside of the, of the, of the search engine to, 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 to administer the results that are given to me by the search engine? So. So Sergey had this idea. You know, when I see a search result here, I, I don't want to visit it, one of these links here, but I want to set it aside for later. Right? So I want to put it in a basket of search results. Simplistic example, but, but there, there is there's some, there's, some, there's some truth in here, actually, at <laughs> some point. <coughs> uh, so. Let's do this project. We're going to walk through this project uh, using the waterfall process. So initiation phase. So what's the business value? That's the first question to, be, to ask. Well, Sergey says, users want this, and if we give them what they want, we make more money on ads. That's true. That's how they think. If the user wants something and they can make more money on it, they, they, they do that. They make that thing. So, so in a way, it's a little bit altruistic, right? Because they really, really raise a sharp focus on what the users want, what the users need. Uh, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, it, it is about making money. Uh, and and I, I was even at a, uh, when I was at Google, I was at a, a presentation by, by Eric Schmidt, who was the, uh, the uh, CEO at that time. And, and he, uh, he proudly told the whole room that, that, he said, guys, we found the only legal way that I'm aware of of printing money. And we just keep printing. He said, it's unbelievable. Google is printing money. And, and where does that money come from? Well, it's advertisers, right? Advertisers pay money to Google, and what they pay for is our attention. They're buying our attention, and Google sits in the middle, just raking in the dough. Uh, philosophically, you might uh, ponder that one. Uh, and it's even more prevalent when it comes to social media, I guess. Uh, I mean, we're worth something like, I think like a $10 a quarter, I think we're worth to Facebook as, a, as, as users. So in Facebook's eyes, our attention on average is worth $10 a quarter. Uh, and we certainly don't treat our personal data as if it's worth $10.
with pissing it away. Uh, okay, so executive sponsor for this project is, uh, is Sergey Brin. Scope, allow users to set aside search results to revisit at a later time. Uh, stakeholders, Sergey, end users, development team, usability team, search product managers, a lot of people, a lot of groups of people. Uh, what, kind, what do we need? What kind of resources? We need software engineers, QA analysts, UI designers, usability folks, and translators. Because at Google, we roll something out, it needs to be translated into, I don't know how many languages. It is at this time, but they have a minimum. Okay, so let's go into the next phase here. So we did initiation and now uh, planning. So what is the scope here? Well, we're going to put a button next to each search result that allows a user to add that result to their basket. And we should have some form of CRUD functionality of the basket. Right? We should be able to see what's in the basket and delete it and empty the basket and so on. Uh, we're starting uh, September 25th, and we're going to finish uh, uh, January 12th. Sorry, uh, December 1st. We switched those in the U.S. to month and date. Still confuses me. Nothing like the weeks, though. <laughs> I've been in Sweden now for, for nine years, and I'm st I still don't know what week number it is, ever. Uh, milestones here. Uh, so... After a week, we should have buttons on the search results page. Uh, another couple of weeks, we should have the basket functionality complete. Uh, you see all the development. Actually, development happens really, really early. Uh, it doesn't mean we're done. Because then we need to do usability testing. We need to do translation, integration testing, performance testing, and then finally demonstration to the uh,
Jag har inte rört den. Okej, okay. har du någon aning om när? Kolla i chatten. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. We're gonna try to figure out. It seems like we lost the sound at some point here. We're gonna try to figure out approximately when it happened. Okay, five minutes ago. Five minutes ago. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, okay. So let let me let me. I, I have no idea what happened there. That's kind of odd. Because I didn't touch any buttons. Uh, so it was no uh, operator error for a uh, for a change. So 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 let me go back to this one again. Then uh, uh, you probably didn't hear me about this one. So uh, kind of the closing of the previous little uh, Sergey Brin case study was a uh, was a. Uh, Okay. Då, tr då tror vi förmodligen då att, att den gick knappt igång. Okay. Jag börjar här igen då. Okej. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hello. Yeah, now it seems to work. Sorry about that. Uh, so this will be then, I don't know if you heard anything about this slide. So, so it will be the third time I talk about this one now. Uh, so, so, so this is John's web agency, the org chart for John's web agency. John, John has white teeth, uh, he likes money, that's why he started a web agency in the, in the uh, second half of the 90s. And his staff consists of six people and is very uh, gender stereotypical. Uh, the females are in customer support and UI design and testing and the males or in, in actual software development or in operations. Uh, this is kind of just to point out that it is like this. Uh, nobody wants it to be like this, but it is. And I've never seen a female uh, uh, person who's responsible for operations environment, for example. You know, they, they look like that. They look like Tom does here. And there's nothing wrong with that but we need, to, we need to change this. And the industry knows that we need to change this and they're working towards changing this. If, if, if for no other reason, because we need more developers and there's a lot of uh, 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 female potential there that is untapped today. So we need to do something about that as, as, a, as, a, as a group of professionals, really. It's not good the way it is right now. We can't keep up. So, uh, as I said, John likes money. And he's always looking for new business opportunities. And so when returning from one lunch one day, he has this fabulous idea, he thinks. I 
you know, there are five restaurants. These are from uh, from Becker. There are five restaurants that he he, he uh, that he uh, frequents when it comes to lunch. And which one he goes to on a given day depends on on what the daily special is at that restaurant. Right? So so how can he find out what the daily specials are? Well, he could check the restaurant's websites before heading out to, to for, for his lunch, but it's kind of cumbersome and the information might not be up to date and so on. He would like to have access to this information. These five restaurants that he is interested in, he doesn't care about the other restaurants in town. These are the five. He would like to have access to this information in one place. So he could you know, tear out the, uh, the, uh, the, the daily special page for the week in the, in the local newspaper and carry that around. But, you know, you shouldn't be have to do that these days. So instead, he says, let's build a service that does this. So we're now going to go through this project. Uh, uh, in the context of the, of the traditional project life cycle. So we assume that the John's Web Agency is now going to develop this service using the waterfall process. So, scope here. So, restaurants should be able to enter their daily specials through a web UI. Seems reasonable. Customers should be able to select which restaurants they want to get information from through a rep responsive web UI. Uh, every morning, an email is sent to the customers, informing them of the daily specials at the restaurants that they have selected. Only those they have selected. Uh, some assumptions here. Some assumptions. John has already spoken to a few restaurants, and they are very interested. It's an assumption. Restaurants are interested. And we should also, you know, restaurants need to authenticate in order to update their daily specials and stuff. Uh, but Customers, is there a way to avoid having the customers uh, 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 authenticating to create a new, yet another account on a service? Uh, what's the business value here? Well, we're going to charge the restaurants a fee for including their offerings. So we're getting revenue that way, or John, John is getting revenue that way. But, but more importantly, we're actually creating a one-to-one -one marketing channel for restaurants that can be leveraged later on. We don't know what can be done with this, with this platform. Imagine restaurants having, having direct access to the customers who have, to, to people who have expressed interest in, 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 in their restaurant. Can be, can be, can be a, can send specials there, special offers, coupons, or what have you. We don't know right now. Uh, sponsorship and funding, John is the sponsor, you know, he's the man. Uh, and uh, we have almost have no other projects going on, so, so, so most of the team is available to work on this project. Still in the initiation phase, engaged stakeholders. Well, John is, is, is engaged. Is he ever engaged? He's almost too engaged. You know, he's jumping up and down of the possibilities of raking in the cash from this kind of service. Uh, and we also need to identify uh, some individuals at restaurants as well as talk to some regular customers. Uh, so a high-level plan, we pitch the new service to all downtown restaurants. We gather requirements from end users. We build a web UI for restaurants, build a web UI for customers, and build some form of list management and email execution engine. Because we need to be, make sure that we don't end up in, in, in junk mailboxes and we need to manage that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's not entirely trivial. It's not difficult, but it's not entirely trivial. It needs to be thought through. Uh, OK, initiation phase is done. Now we're getting into planning. So dive down a little bit more in, ter in terms of detail. So restaurants, as we say, should have a web UI, authentication required. Uh, they should be able to sign up a customer's customer themselves if they say you have a restaurant that sometimes they have these big big uh, 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 vases on the, on the bar counter or something where people can put their, their business cards for, uh, for uh, raffles or whatever you have. Uh, so, so the restaurant should be able to get, get uh, kind of customers into their system uh, uh, themselves without people having to sign up necessarily. Uh, and uh, for customers, web UI without authentication, they should be able to, customers should be able to make 
selections and update selections. They should be able to unsubscribe from the emails and so the basic functionality. Uh, internally, the email sending we need to deal with. Open questions. How can we avoid authentication for customers? Is there a way to do that? Uh, can restaurants see who selected them? Need to think about that. What about bounce and open rates of the emails that we send out? I mean, bounce, bounce rates. Bounce, a bounce is that the email doesn't, does not reach the recipient, but you get a bounce message back. It could not be delivered or something like that. Well, we would like to know that as operators of this service, we need to know whether the emails actually reach the recipients or not. Uh, but if it reaches the ex recipient, we also want to know whether they open this email or not. So we need to implement some form of, of, a, of a, you can have this one, one by one pixel tracking things to, to, to track whether emails are open or not. Still in the planning phase, how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to use the, uh, the stack that, that uh, we have expertise on, which is PHP and MySQL. Uh, hosting of this is, this is not a high traffic thing, so we can just throw this on one of our regular servers, existing servers. Uh, Web UI for restaurants, we're going to use SSL for security. We're going to use simple authentication, some password policy functionality, forgotten password, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, syntax, allowed syntax of, pass of passwords. Uh, we're going to have a database of offers, obviously, uh, for this particular restaurant. Uh, we will have, for customers, we'll have a web UI. Uh, where they can make their selections and they should be able to, to, to uh, unsubscribe there as well. And then we have the email sending and, and list management. Budget, it's kind of guessing, right? So we say it's going to take 11 person months. And staffing, well, you know, we have one and a half software developers. Uh, Vlad is fully available. Fred is, is, uh, is, is occupied with maintenance and some other things half of his time. Uh, Emma is completely available for, for design and testing. Uh, Tom is, half of his time is available. Uh, half of Marlin is available. And a quarter of John, because John is a busy guy, you know, he's out there uh, looking for uh, opportunities for the next big thing. Uh, and we're going to start this October 1st, and we're going to end it January 1st. Uh, milestones here, give it a week to get, to give John a week to get requirements from uh, end users, both uh, customers and restaurants. Uh, the database schema should be done essentially, there's, there's nothing, there's no rocket science here, so, so it should be done after a week as well. UI design should be finished a week later, and a week, two weeks after that the restaurant UI should be functional, another week customer UI functional. Another week, email sending based on selections, functional. Another couple of weeks, security aspects should be dealt with. Uh, another week, functional testing complete. Another week, performance testing complete. Another week, make service available to friends and family. And then launch on January 1st to everybody. What are the risks? Well, can we be viewed as spammers and end up in the bulk mail folder? How does that work? Well, you know, this depends. It depends on the, the, on the email service providers that the, uh, that the end users have. I mean, say that, say that you, you one of the end users has a, has a Gmail address, for example. So Google, through Gmail, is an email service provider. Uh, as a provider of a service to you, it's in their interest to keep you there, right? For you to come back and use this service. They want you to use their service. And so it's in their interest to make the service as, as, as pleasant as possible for you. And so it is in their interest not to allow spammers to, to clutter your inbox, right? So they would like to be able to determine when an email comes in to the email service, service provider addressed to you, they would like to be able to decide, 
is this of interest at all, or is this going to be considered spam by you, by this particular user? Uh, <laughs> well, traditionally, the way email service providers dealt with that was by, by, by analyzing, and they still do, I think, to some extent, by analyzing the actual content of the incoming email, the email that's being sent to you. So they look for, for uh, kind of red flags there uh, in order to determine whether this is, a, uh, this is spam or not, whether this should, whether this should be either let, let in at all or, or let in and put in your bulk mail folder or it should be come into your uh, regular inbox. Right? Uh, the way they do it today very much is that they realize that, that what spam for one person has, is, is, is valuable for another person. So, so they're starting more and more to look at whether people open the emails or not. So even if it looks like spam, if you keep opening these emails, uh, Google uh, concludes that this is not spam to you because you're actually opening them. So we should let those emails through to you. So, so the lesson here is if you don't want those kind of emails, don't click on them. <laughs> so just leave them. Do not open them. Because if you open them, you're going to get more. So you kind of make your own bed there. So careful what you click on. Uh, so that's the, uh, the uh, 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 so there's the risk here, ending up in the bulk mail folder. Uh, we also need some form of design. This is another risk that we're calling out here. Some form of design to, uh, to, to, to avoid this requirement of auth authentication for, for, for uh, end users. Okay, and then we, this is then the high level plan. Uh, uh, or this is the plan, rather. Uh, and uh, so we use some tool. This is just an Excel spreadsheet, uh, which is still the most commonly used tool for managing projects uh, due to its, its flexibility, simply. Uh, so here we have the different milestones, and we have the, uh, the, uh, the planned start and end date of those, and we have uh, resources associated with most of the uh, pretty much every kind of tasks here, task. <laughs> and so <coughs> we're starting. First of October, we're starting. And we jump a week into the future. And it turns out that John has been too busy. So he hasn't been able to, to gather more than like 50%. That's his own assessment 50% of the requirement. Uh, Tom, kind of knowing what's going to happen anyway, he has already finished the database schema. Uh, <laughs> pretty common dynamic, actually. Those guys who just rush ahead and, and, uh, and, and for good reasons. Uh, and since the requirements are late, uh, Emma has not been able to make a whole lot of headway on the, on the UI design. But she's done a little bit. And uh, at the bottom here, we see that, you know, this is getting the domain name for this service. You know, Tom did that already. Right? He did that after two days. Because he's fast. And he likes people to tell him he's fast. We all do. So another week into the, f into the future. Uh, now uh, John is done. He was five days late. So we can see at the top there, he finished 12th of October instead of 7th of October. Uh, and uh, Emma is a little bit behind because, uh, uh, because she was delayed by, by John. She's designed the restaurant UI, and Vlad and Fred have actually uh, already started a little bit of implementation of that. Uh, but she's now a little bit behind when it comes to the customer, customer UI design. I'm going to jump two weeks into the future. Uh, design is now still not complete, but implementation has started. Uh, Tom has done some work, has allocated the service space, and the implementation of the restaurant UI is now complete. We jump a month into the future. 
Vlad has been sick for a week. So the tasks that he were assigned to are delayed. He didn't even start with, uh, for example, the, uh, the security for customers. Uh, he's only halfway down with uh, unsubscription for email. Uh, and you know, chances are, I mean, we're talking about November here, right? So he probably has a kid. That's probably why he's sick, right? How do you know? But he got sick for a week. Another two weeks into the future. Now, Vlad is still behind. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the customer UI is not completely tested. Or it's not even ready to test yet because Vlad is behind. And, uh, and then he passed on the bug to Fred, right? They're probably sitting close to each other, all sitting in one big office, and then except for John, who has his own office. Uh, so they're passing the bugs around to each other. So Fred was sick for a week. And at this point, we realized that, you know, we're not going to be able to, to launch on, on, on January 1st, but we delayed the launch by, uh, by two weeks until January 15th. Seventh of January, we realized that there's some optimization, database optimization that needs needs to be done before uh, 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 we can launch this to, to to the general public, and this was a result of performance testing. And so at this point, we decide to delay the launch an additional week till till January twenty uh, second. And so on the 22nd of January, we demo the service to John. We develop this handover plan. Marlin will be the customer support, take care of customer support. Vlad will take care of technical support. Tom will monitor uh, uh, resource usage. And Tom will also develop some internal report for, for, for usage of the service that we've developed. Because if we don't have any insight into how it's being used, how do, how, how do you know how it's going, right? How do you know if you want to change, need to change anything or not? So this one we forgot in the initial requirements that we internally, we also, that this is commonly the case that you develop things for, for the customers and then you forget about the internal tools that you need in order to provide good service to those customers. So the delay here, the, 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 the sicknesses in particular, and, and John dragging his feet, uh, uh, delayed, cost a delay of four person months above budget. So what do we learn here? A four person month, by the way, on a, on a project that was, was, was expected to allocate, we had allocated uh, uh, 11 person months from the beginning to, to be, f so four out of, of, of Four plus eleven is fifteen. So four out of fifteen, uh, that's that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty close to the target, which we will see soon. It's, it's kind of a, it's a sad state of affairs. Uh, so what have we learned here? Well, we cannot just rely on on John for requirements. We need we need we, we cannot do that in the future. Uh, we need to build in some buffer for people getting sick. And uh, we need to attack the riskiest tasks earlier in the project because there were problems here uh, caused by the uh, uh, lack of uh, absence of authentication for, for end customers. And we only have five restaurants participating right now. So we need to, next time we need to secure more clients earlier on. Uh, I think I'll take a, a, a 10 minute break here. So resume in 10 minutes.
we're back. Uh, so, so I've showed you two kind of toy, toy projects, um, and we saw in the second one how here how uh, um, somebody getting sick kind of threw the project uh, off its course. Uh, but it's it's way worse than that. Here are, are here are these these numbers here on this slide are come from a survey uh, from the U.S. a few years ago uh, where a, a large number of, of, of companies were asked about their IT projects. So the sad state of affairs is that they most fail the IT projects. So we mostly fail at, at delivering what we have promised or what's being expected from us. So the average IT project is twice as expensive as budgeted. I mean, that's this is a mind-boggling number. It takes twice as long as planned, and it only has 65% of the required functionality at, at, at completion. I mean, this is, this, is, this is horrendous, right? I mean, if this is how we deliver, and this, so this, this, this is based on, 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 on real data, if this is what we deliver as a group of prof professionals, why is there any confidence in us at all? Right? We don't really, really don't deserve it. And, and you might think, okay, say we start a new project. So if it costs twice, if it's going to cost twice as much as budgeted, well, how about we budget double then? And it's going to take twice as long as, as we're planning for it to take. Well, how about we say it's going to take twice as long as we think it's going to take? Then we'll be home free, right? Then we'll meet, hit the targets. Well, no, we won't. Because if we say it's going to cost twice as much, if we need twice as many resources and it's going to take twice as much time, what's going to happen is that, is that the higher-ups who are deciding which projects to do, because there's always an enormous amount of projects that can be done. The, the tricky thing is selecting which projects to do. Right? They all have a business case, right? They all provide business value. So uh, as an executive, you're sitting up there, which projects am I going to choose to fund out of these possible projects? Well, you're certainly not going to decide to fund something that looks very expensive and it's going to take a long time. So being honest in and padding the numbers is backfiring because it just means that you don't get to do it at all. So instead, everybody is living, is everybody is delusional, right? So we say it's going to take three months, even though we think, that based on historical data, it's going to take six months. But we say three months. The recipient of that message, the executive, say, it looks at these, these three months and, it's, and, and he thinks, yeah, you know, things never end on time, but it says three months here, so that's what I'm going to base my decision on. So, so, so being honest in your assessment, taking empirical data into account like, like this that we have on this slide, uh, is not helping your case, which is a little bit frustrating. So people rather live in their illusion than have their illusion shattered by empirical data. And we all do <laughs> in all aspects of life. We live our illusion, and if we see empirical data that is contradicting the stories that we have created, the stories that are making up who we are, the world we live in, any, any contradicting data, typically we just brush it aside because our story, the maintenance of this story of our identity, of our ego, is more important than questioning it most of the time. You can probably see it yourself. I mean, if you ever read any, if you ever read any any kind of political articles or anything, or or, or, or opinions in newspapers and so on, uh, you know, when you 
look at yourself what you choose to read. And uh, at least for me, I tend to choose to read things that are just supporting my own story of how things are, who I am. I do not want somebody questioning that story because, because my life is built on that story being true. So I just walk around looking for confirmation of my own story rather than looking for questioning of parts of my story. It's just human behavior, I think. Uh, so, most projects fail. And then they, they didn't only ask them how many of your projects fail and how bad is, how ba bad is it. They also asked them, why do you think they fail? <laughs> so, from the same study. And the, the, the response to this survey was that the top reason for failure, perceived reason by the respondents in these corporations, is incomplete requirements of the project. It's lack of user, end user, or customer involvement in developing what it is that we need to develop. It's lack of resources, lack of executive support, and I mentioned that one earlier. Uh, changing requirements, an unrealistic schedule, poor communication. But some projects succeed, and they ask them, why do projects succeed? top factor of success, this is pretty, pretty remarkable, is user involvement, right? We tend to think that we know what the users want, but especially if it's a consumer-facing product or service, and because we are consumers too, those, are those who are building the product itself, and so we think we know, because I'm a consumer too, so of course I know, but it turns out that we don't. As much as we want to believe that we know, we don't most of the time. Uh, so you kind of need to build that into the process that you involve end users, and we will get to that in, in the rest of, of during the rest of the day. Uh, clear business objectives was effective su success. So it matters whether the people who are building this product actually understand why are we building this product, right? What's the, what's the real purpose here? Are we saving the customer money by eliminating uh, some, some erroneous, error-prone uh, uh, data entry, manual data entry tasks? What is it, right? Why are we doing this? So apparently, understanding of that helps with the with the with the likelihood of, of succeeding in the in the in the pursuit, adjusted scope meaning that you know we can cut things, uh, agile process and that's what this course is about. So we'll talk about that length that at length for the rest of, of, of today, and project management expertise, and then most likely what they're talking when I talk about project management expertise is 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 what the domain expertise and technical expertise does the project manager have? So it's not only a paper pusher or somebody uh, uh, collecting status reports, but somebody who's actually making themselves useful for the project as well. And I've seen many times, if you have project managers who are not technical at all, ma they're managing a group of, 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 of developers, uh, they have very, it's very difficult for them to get any form of, to establish any credibility with the, with, the, with, the, with the engineering team because they don't know anything about what the engineers are talking about. So how can they possibly uh, uh, provide any form of guidance or, or good ideas or suggestions about what sh how sh things should be solved? So, uh, Here's this, this, this slide again, or the, the, uh, the, the, the picture again with the initiation, planning, execution, control, and completion. Now, this kind of way of doing things, of running a project, assumes a predictable world. It assumes that all the requirements are known at the beginning, because you know planning happens before execution and control, and if you have been planned for it, if you don't have the requirements at the time, 
when you do the planning, then you cannot plan for the execution and control for this, that particular aspect, whatever it is. Right? So it assumes that requirements are, are, are known at the start and that they're clear. It assumes that the competitive landscape doesn't change after we start this project. So it kind of makes the assumption that we know everything going into this. While we develop our thing here, we execute it or run this project, the rest of the world, all our competitors, are just going to grind to a standstill and they're going to stand there and wait until we launch our new fantastic product. It's clearly not feasible. Right? It's not happening. The competitors run as fast as they possibly can. Right? They might launch a product that's directly competing with, your, with, your, with your, uh, the product you're developing halfway through the project. Then what? Right? We can't know that beforehand. As much as we want to control, try to control the world, as the Buddhists say, the only thing that we know is that everything is changing. It's the only thing we know. And, but we don't act that way. We want to somehow instill some form of control of what can happen here in the future. We assume that stakeholders don't change their minds. Right? We assume that the executive who is sponsoring this doesn't change his or her mind. And, you know, the executives, they get ideas from everywhere all the time. Right? And they're pretty, they don't know how difficult things are, so they're pretty naive in one sense in that, so they hear about this new cool thing that was done by, by a friend of them at some other company. Uh, 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 and so they want to do that in their company as well. Right? So they change their minds. We cannot know that beforehand. We assume that the availability of resources doesn't change from the time the, pro the, the project is started. Well, new projects, or if the pro project is important enough, they're going to put kind of a, a high caliber technical folks to work on it. Right? So the project starts and the main system that's bringing in the revenues which are paying for this project, the main system goes down. Right? It, that's the bread and butter of our whole operation of this business, goes down. If we don't fix that, this project is history. So we need to fix what's broken because we, cannot, we need to stop the bleeding, essentially. So who's going to do that? Well, they're going to put the most experienced developers at the task that is the most important for the corporation right now. And those most experienced developers are probably developers on some projects. So they would be pulled off of these projects and so you don't have, no longer have the resources that you, that you were promised in the begin, beginning of the project. So things change all the time. Now, one way of address this to address this is, is what is called iterative methodologies as opposed to the waterfall methodology. And the motivation here is that requirements do change. Right? They do change, we know that. And the world around us changes after we have started our project. And so in iterative methodologies, they're saying, okay, let's embrace this change. The change will happen whether we want it or not. So let's try to make the best out of the fact that the, the, the world will change all the time. So iterative methodologies, and I will show you an example of this. Uh, so they, 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 they embrace the fact that change will happen, whereas traditional methodologies, they tend to kind of minimize the impact of the change that is happening. Now, I see similarities between this and what is happening in the world today, as a matter of fact. I uh, think of a, 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 the, the waterfall process, if you make the analogy of the, the waterfall process being, being a nation state. Right? We have our nation states, like Sweden is a nation state, Germany, Denmark, whatever, they're nation states. And these nation state, in these nation states, we do th we, we, we have, there's a culture in the nation states. Uh, there's a cultural heritage. We do things a certain way here. This is how things work here, right? In Sweden, we have there's a lot of a lot of of, of, of norms, uh, which are not always 
explicit, but they are there in society. Uh, we, we have the, uh, the welfare state that we have decided collectively through, through, through the democratic process that this is something that's important. So we're holding on to this welfare state. We're holding on to these things. So we're trying to maintain some form of status quo. Right? This is the way we're doing things. Things are happening in the rest of the world, right? but we're going to stick to our, 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 our guns. Right? And this is how we do things here. Now, then things happen that, that affect the, 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 the way we run things inside of a nation state. For example, mass migration, right? A huge a tidal wave of, of, of refugees show up, right? And being the, 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 the good conscience of the world, uh, Sweden says that we need to take a lot of these. But our processes are not designed for this, this comes out of left field somehow, right? This is left field. Uh, so our processes and the way we're running things are not designed to deal with, with, with this, these big changes in our society. And so we create kind of, we're trying to minimize the impact of the change that this inflow of refugees has in our, in our society. Uh, but in effect what we're doing is we're trying to to maintain our status quo while this thing is happening that is threatening our status quo. But the thing is, I think mass migration, given what we're doing to, 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 to Mother Earth, mass migration might be the norm rather than exception in the future. We're treating the ref stream of refugees as an exception to our normal way of doing things. And if we keep doing that, and there's going to be more and more and more and more exceptions, then we're going to spend an enormous amount of effort on, on trying to, to reduce the impact of, of these exceptions to the way we normally run things. Right? So, so there are similarities here. Right? Things are changing. We cannot set ourselves up for a scenario when things are not changing because we're kind of just digging a hole for ourselves. You're going to get too busy dealing with the changes. So, uh, iterative methodologies, there, you, you, you choose something to do and then you do it a little bit and then you, t you check it with whoever is, is, uh, is defining kind of the requirements for this. And you, you, you show it to them and ask them, is this it? Is this, is, am, I all al along the, am I on the right path here to deliver what you want? They might say, no. Or they might say, yeah, just continue. And you do a little bit more work, and you show it to them again. And you continue with that process until the, the, the customer or, or whoever, yeah, the client, is satisfied with what you, what, what you provided them with. So <laughs> here's an example of that. Uh, so. It's about Mona Lisa. So, so Leonardo has been asked to paint Mona Lisa. So he, makes, he starts by making a sketch. So this is an exemplification of iterative methodology. He starts by making a sketch and shows it to whoever commissioned this piece of work. He says, will this work? <coughs> and, uh, and the client says, no, she must be turned left. Well, it's a good thing he didn't finish. That's the point here. He didn't waste the work by finishing it and then being told that, that her, she, uh, she, she must be turned the other way. So it's a good thing he didn't finish and wasted that work. So he makes that change, make her look to the, to, to the left instead, and adds a little bit of color, and then he shows it again to the client. And now the client says, oh, her head is too big. Again, it's a good thing he didn't finish. And then he makes that change and shows it to the client again and says, is this better? Now the client says, I prefer bigger eyes, but for the price I pay, it's OK. Right? So you iterate. You do something simple, some form of straw man of things, a sketch of things. Show it. Is this on the right path? If not, you modify your direction. If it's right, you just continue, do a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Keep showing it to who cares about the results of this until you're done.
Right? So that's iterative. Another type of methodology is incremental. Here again, motivation is requirements do change, but also partial functionality is valuable. Right? Because it might be that, that there's some functionality in this service or product that you're, bu you're building that can actually be launched to clients without everything being finished. And the clients might get value out of it. And you might actually get a revenue stream coming in before you finished your project. Right? So what you do here is that you're breaking the project, break up the project, the product, the service, into smaller chunk, which each one of them has some form of business value. And then you deal with one chunk at a time. So here's an example of that. So here we have uh, 12 chunks of functionality. Uh, and each chunk has a UI piece, a middleware piece. The UI piece is the top layer of this, of this uh, 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 cube. Uh, middleware piece is the middle layer, and the back end piece is simpl simplistic, but it, 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 it proves the point. Uh, and the bottom layer is the, is the back end piece. And a uh, subcube of this is, is solid if that piece of work has been done. So what we're seeing here, for example, is that the the leftmost uh, column of, of, of subcubes here are all done, which means that that's a complete piece of functionality. So we took that piece of functionality corresponding to that column of, of subcubes, and we implemented the UI, the middleware, and the back end for that. While we did it, we also did a little bit of UI for some other pieces of functionality. Right? But there's only one piece of functionality that's complete here. And then you take one piece of functionality, one chunk at a time, and eventually you're done with everything. And now Agile. Agile is simply, well, simply, is incremental plus iterative. So you pick a chunk, piece of functionality, then you iterate until that's done. When that's done, you take a next piece of functionality, you iterate until that's done, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, until it's all done. And the the the, the beauty of a, the kind of the value proposition here of agile versus traditional waterfall ways of 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 of, uh, of developing uh, uh, software uh, is. You can see it in these, these four cases here, and these four, four quadrants here of this, of this uh, image. Uh, visibility into what is going on in the project is much higher in Agile than in traditional. In traditional, you formulate, you, you, decide, you, 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 you uh, uh, nail down the requirements up front, and then you start with your, your, uh, your, uh, uh, your analysis and design and, and the implementation. And after the requirements have, have been defined up front, somebody outside of the project really has no idea what's going on, right? Because it might be that, that the entire team is working on, 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 on the database layer, for example. So there's nothing to show. So whoever is the product manager cannot see anything at all until the whole project is finished. With Agile, since you're picking one piece of functionality, a chunk of functionality, and do that until, until it's, it's, it's uh, 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 satisfied, it, until the, 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 uh, the product manager is satisfied, uh, you're going to show them what you've done with regular intervals, because we all do all these things in, 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 in uh, fixed size iterations. So at regular intervals, typically every couple of weeks, the product manager gets to see what you've done. So it's a completely different degree of, of, of kind of transparency in the, in the, in the, in the process. Uh, second one, uh, adaptability. Well, in traditional ones, once you nail down the requirements, they cannot change ever. Uh, but in Agile, uh, if you work on one chunk of functionality, the product manager can change their mind about the next ch chunk of functionality whenever they want to. As long as you're not working on it right now, they can change it. 
once you start working on it, they cannot change it. Uh, <laughs> so, so the product manager can, can set you out on one track, and then based on how it's going, they can change their minds as to where they want to go. And as a development team, you don't really care. Uh, business value, uh, the business value here, if you pick a chunk, a piece of functionality that actually has business value, well, then you can generate business value earlier in the process, whereas in traditional uh, 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 project management, you don't get any business value until it's finished. And only in the best case when it's finished, because the question is whether you actually ended up building what the customer is happy with. And we'll get more to that in the, uh, this afternoon. So, the Agile Manifesto. So, the Agile Manifesto uh, came out of a, was a group of, uh, of software professionals who uh, were all uh, depressed over the sad state of affairs of how we're delivering as a, as a professional group in society. Uh, so these were kind of high-powered, high really, really sharp software professionals. I think it was, a, I don't know, it was 10 or 15 or 20 of them or something. So they got together in, in a place called Snowbird, uh, Utah, in a cabin in the, in the Rocky Mountains uh, in 2002, and, and, and to talk about this. What are we going to do? Right? This cannot continue. And, and what they came out with was the Agile Manifesto. And so the Agile Manifesto, we're going to see it again later on, uh, says that we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So it says we value. So we put more focus on individuals and interactions than processes and tools. It does not say that we do not value processes and tools, but focus on the individuals and interactions between these individuals. We value working software over comprehensive documentation. Uh, documentation that doesn't lead to any product has no value. Right? There's an enormous amount of documents being produced about some piece of software that we, that we want to build. And, and there's this false sense of value in these documents because, because uh, kind of human cognitive work has gone into producing this document that describes something wonderful if we manage to build it. But if we don't manage to build it, what's the value? of that information? What is the value of that work that has been done, put into producing these documents? It's close to zero. Right? So you spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of resources on something that has some artificial value. If it doesn't lead to any business value, it has no value. As a matter of fact, there's an opportunity cost being missed here. If you spend, spend effort on stuff that never sees the light of day, uh, you could have spent that effort improving something that, will, that does see the light of day, that you know you're building right now. So do not waste time preparing for things that you will never do. That's just a waste of time and effort. Uh, we value customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Uh, contracts are, uh, the whole purpose of a contract is to, is to mitigate risk. Right? I, I, I have a contract which, which, which if something goes bad, goes wrong, this con I can rely on this contract to compensate me somehow. Uh, that's not how Agile works. Agile is based on interaction with the customer the entire time uh, with the understanding that, that, that if we interact, the results will be better. And if the results are better, the client is happy. If the client is happy, 
I am happy as a provider of service to, to, to this client because even if I deliver to the client exactly what they requested from the beginning, uh, unless they are happy in the end, they're not going to come back to me. So doing a good job delivering what was being requested is not good enough. The importance is to have a happy client who comes back to you for, 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 for more business. And this then goes back to, to this, the idea that the clients can know everything before the project starts and that nothing changes after the project starts. Well, that's, that's not the case. So how can you formulate a contract that, that is ignoring this fact that, everything, uh, that things are going to change? It doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, so, so we need to take on, when it comes to kind of clients and, and uh, producers and, and consumers or clients and, 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 and buyers, of the, uh, buyers of technical services and the providers of technical services, it has to become more collaborative. It just, it just has to. It cannot be, today it's kind of the contract, it's kind of an adversarial kind of thing, right? You're protecting yourselves from it. You're protecting yourself from the other party somehow. But in order for the end result to be good, you need to be in bed with the other party. You cannot be on opposite sides of the fence. It doesn't work anymore. And this then, of course, has ramifications in, in, in the legal services industry. Uh, because the traditional contracts, they're used for everything. It's, it's, it's do domain independent. It doesn't matter if it's software or not. It's, 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 it's the law somehow. And and, but now, there's, there's so many of the disputes when it comes to, 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 to uh, uh, business relationships. Kind of they're suing each other left and right. And it's very often due to what we just talked about. Misunderstandings, not enough communication. And so how do you create the contract that has built in uh, 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 engagement with the client. Well, that contract, now, that contract is no longer really a way to protect either side from each other. It's really a contract about forcing both sides to collaborate. Kind of. So I, w was, I think it was five years ago I went to a, a, a seminar uh, where there was a lawyer speaking, and uh, he was using Scrum terminology when he was speaking. So this is, this is, this is nothing new in the legal community. Nothing new at all. Not fixed yet, but work is being done. And then the last one in the Agile Manifesto. We value responding to change over following a plan. And yeah, this should be pretty self-evident by now uh, because change, change will happen. So to, 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 to kind of boneheaded following a plan uh, ignoring all the red flags and all the changes that are happening around us, ignoring all the empirical data, is just that boneheaded. We can't do that anymore. We've done that for too long. So that's the, the end of this uh, first presentation. So we talked about what a project is. You had this uh, kind of attributes of a uh, of uh, time-based and resources and budget and, uh, and uh, goal, etc. cetera. Uh, it talked about project management, what that is, and it's really just about managing a project from, from initiation to completion, which then deals a lot with, uh, with resources, with, uh, with uh, human beings, uh, keeping plan up to date, etc. cetera. Uh, oh, sorry, that was the traditional project life cycle. Uh, then we looked at uh, John's web agency, a uh, little, little uh, f uh, fake case study. Uh, and then we looked at iterative methods, which iterate. You don't, you don't complete right away, but, but uh, you iterate and show it to the customer until you get it right. And then incremental methods, where we take a chunk of functionality and we build that first. And then when we're done with that, we take another fun chunk of functionality and then finally, agile methodologies, which are then the happy marriage between iterative and incremental. So 
take a chunk of functionality, we iterate until we're done with that, then we take another chunk of functionality, we iterate until we're done with that. With that. It's really, d these are, as I said initially, I think, it's all commonsensical, this, because, so you take one, you take something and you get that right, and you take another thing and you get that right, instead of taking everything at the same time and try to provide the plumbing necessary for everything, you provide enough plumbing so that you can actually develop what you need to develop. And as a side effect of this, you're exercising your entire stack, as a matter of fact. The, uh, the uh, incremental methods forces you to, to exercise your entire stack and not build the stack first and then plug things in at the top afterwards and, and hook up the plumbing. But you're testing your stack as you, as you go along here. Uh, yeah, that's it. So, so after lunch, uh, I will talk about, the entire afternoon will be about Scrum, which is one of the Agile methodologies. It just so happens to be the, uh, I shouldn't say standard, but, but something like over 70% of all, uh, uh, all projects that use some Agile methodology are using either Scrum or some, some modified version of Scrum. But we'll talk about that after lunch. So, uh, Thank you. See you then.